In 1943, during the darkest days of World War II, the faith and compassion of four men was to shine like a beacon on a night of terror. These four military chaplains, men of different faiths, not only changed the lives of all who knew them, but lit the way for a new kind of America. It sounds too cliche. It sounds like this is, this is the politically correct story. You know, well, we need a, we need a, a, a rabbi, we need a priest, and, uh, and yeah, we got a couple Protestants. We'll throw them in there. In fact, these men of faith really were a cross-section of the folks who were called into service. I'm a part of this heritage. I'm a part of this tradition and, and a part of what they demonstrated in such a courageous way. The Army was in great need to transport its troops, and so they called into commission old battleships. They called in commission old cruise liners. The Dorchester was a converted cruise liner, and it was built and designed for cruises up and down the East Coast. When it was used as a cruiser for recreational purposes, it, it only housed 373 people. But once the Army was finished with painting a battleship gray and train, changing the interior of the ship, they were able to get 900 servicemen on this uh, transporter. They ripped out all of those luxury cabins and replaced them with bunks. It was uh, a cattle car that, that floated. We looked at the boat and it was terrible. It's a horrible looking old boat. But, uh, you know, we, we knew we were going overseas, but we didn't know where. Aboard the Dorchester, there were four chaplains. One was a Roman Catholic priest named John Washington. Another was a Jewish rabbi named Alexander Good. There was two Protestants, Chaplain Poling and Chaplain Fox. They were all lieutenants. They had all gone to chaplain school. And the four of them found that they all had so much in common. They thought in terms of humanity and not just in terms of their own individual community. That you had four chaplains who were of differing religious backgrounds and different faith groups were able to put aside those differences was really a testimony to their understanding that in order to be victorious, we had to work together. A lesson the chaplains would teach every day with every breath. A lesson that would prove vital when the ship and its young soldiers sailed into deadly waters and into the crosshairs of a Nazi wolf pack. The Dorchester was docked there in New York City The chaplains joined the throngs of men that were gathering on board the ship. My uncle was George Fox, and uh, he was uh, uh, a hero in World War I. He was only 17, and on the battlefield in France, when they were being gassed, he was driving an ambulance and uh, saw a couple of men who were down on the field without gas masks. He runs out onto the field with his gas mask on, takes off his gas mask, puts it on the man, puts him on his back, and runs back to the ambulance. He did this twice. He was a hero, although he never thought of himself as that. He loved practical jokes, loved to uh, dress up and to play tricks and uh, do all sorts of shenanigans. He was a very humorous man. When World War II broke out, Fox decided to go to war again. He was 42 years old. He knew what he was getting into, and he knew what those young men were getting into. And he wanted to do everything that he could to support them. Many of the Army soldiers on the Dorchester were brand new recruits. They were young. They were 18, 19 years old. I'm a Brooklyn boy, Brooklyn, New York. When we boarded the Dorchester, I was just 21 years of age. They were young street kids from Chicago. They were off the farms of Indiana. They were young folks from the South who 
couldn't find work. They were, they were from a, a real cross section of America. Guys that had probably only been away from home for maybe 10, 12 weeks at the most. And now they're already in military uniform on this military transporter, uh, taking them off to combat. Nine hundred soldiers and sailors began their mission, not knowing what destiny had in store for them. After boarding the ship in New York Harbor and they set sail, there was a sense of fear that began to mount amongst the troops because they knew that they were moving into very troubled waters. The Germans at, at that point had laid waste to an entire continent. They were the ultimate war machine. If those soldiers on the Dorchester were not afraid, there was something wrong with them. They were in tight quarters. It was January. It was very cold to be out on deck. So many of the men were down below just to stay warm. The North Atlantic, as I found out, is a very treacherous place. The ship was being thrown from front to back and from one side to the other side. We were all very, very seasick. The chaplains would come through giving aid and comfort to the soldiers. And they themselves had turned green in the face because they were suffering just as much as the men were. They talked to everybody because they didn't, uh, you know, know whether you're a Catholic or what you were, you know. When the four chaplains came together and were seen together and telling jokes together, sitting together at dinner and all, it really shocked a lot of the men on the ship because in their hometowns, they didn't see much of that. The chaplains were more like friends to all soldiers on board. They were there to do anything for the men who felt they needed someone to talk to or they needed someone to play cards or anything else. They were just four great human beings. Father Washington was walking through the mess hall and there was a uh, card game going on and one of the men thought he would get a little heavenly help in winning his game. So he called Father Washington over and said, Father, Father, come over here and would you bless my hand, please? And Father Washington comes over and he looks down at it and he says, Ha! I should waste my blessing on a lousy pair of trays. And everybody just broke up. And of course, the card game did too. Father Washington is a type of chaplain I would really like to work with. He was somewhat of a character who loved to sing, who loved to joke around. He loved people. Here he was a member of a street gang when he was growing up, kind of, you know, had the hard knocks of life. But he was able to smooth that over in becoming an army chaplain. When he was just a kid, he became extremely ill, and so ill that uh, his family had to bring in a priest to give him the last rites. And it looked like he was gone. But then by some miracle, he survived. And from then on, he felt he really knew what he was going to do in life. He was going to institutionalize his humanitarianism and become a priest. Services were established on Friday night for the Jewish faith and then also for Sunday uh, for the Protestant and also for the Catholics. Some of the men went to the services of all the different chaplains. When the chaplains opened up their services to other people, they might be subject to a lot of criticism by people who are of an orthodox faith and say, how could you invite in a Catholic person to a Jewish service or a Jewish person to a Catholic service? This is something that they had to choose to do because they had compassion for people who are different. They had services in the galley. 
The galley, after a meal was served, would be converted into a, a place of worship. When Rabbi Good announced that he was going to have a service, uh, we were all anxious to get together and be together like a family. When Chaplain Good was in the process of holding his first Jewish service on a Friday evening, and all the servicemen were playing cards in, in the galley. And there was a, a bit of a dispute because some of the soldiers who were playing cards didn't want to give up their card game for the sake of a Jewish worship service. Chaplain Washington said to them, you better stop right now and let the rabbi do the services. He said, I'm from a good Irish background and I'm not gonna tolerate this, uh, not allowing the rabbi to have services. And the men said, sorry, Father, won't happen again, Padre. And uh, Chaplain Good was able to hold worship services. Alexander Good was a remarkable man. Rabbi Good managed to change the whole social structure of his town by writing in the newspapers and speaking on the radio and uh, communicating wherever he could uh, how all people should be equal and that prejudice is against the word of God. Soon, the whole educational system of the town was changed because of him. In 1931, he wrote about Hitler and the rise of Hitler, and he foresaw what was coming to the Jewish people. One of the reasons that made him join the army during the Second World War was what was happening to the Jewish people in Germany the Holocaust. He was very patriotic about being an American and what America represents. If you think about it, the other three chaplains are Christians, Catholic, Dutch Reformed, and Methodist, but they're all Christians. It's Alexander Good that really makes the mix work. He's the glue. And the other three saw his passion and his compassion for people. And that's what uh, he's about. As chaplains, a teamwork atmosphere has to exist. You've got to call on your brother, your, your fellow chaplain that you work alongside with. And many times, the chaplains of a completely different faith group from what your background is. The Dorchester ended up pulling in three days later to Newfoundland. The ship offloaded its precious cargo of men, not to sightsee, but rather for a 10-mile ruck march. All, all soldiers will have their, what we call their rucksack. We'll, we'll always load 40 pounds inside these rucksacks. And it's, it's pretty much just doing a very, very fast march. The chaplains, of course, being good chaplains and wanting to maximize their time with the troops, uh, didn't use their status as commissioned officers to stay on board and, and grab some more sleep. They went out and, and did this ruck march with these men. A lot of them have looks on their face like, you know, you know, why are you here first of all? And, and uh, wow, he's, he's, he's going to he's gonna go through this with us. That was a great way in order to just kind of relieve the tension, help him get focused and, and maybe relieve some of the fear that, that was building up. After the Dorchester left uh, St. John's and went into the open sea, the Germans got word that the convoy was heading toward Greenland. The Dorchester was now on a collision course with the enemy. Fear would stalk the decks. Its primary antidote, faith, and the four chaplains who understood its power. The Dorchester put out, headed toward Greenland. It was part of a convoy, two other transports. There were three Coast Guard vessels that were to provide a transport escort. Well, I was in the U.S. Coast Guard on one of the cutters, uh, the Comanche. We had been on convoys before this uh, up to Greenland. And on every one of them, there were ships that were sunk. Rumors were really getting thick with 
ships that were getting taken out by submarines en route to Greenland. The Coast Guard cutters started to pick up submarines on the radar. The word came from that Coast Guard escort. They were being followed by German submarines. German submarines were operating in groups, groups known as wolf packs. It was hard to determine where they were and when they would strike. The tonnage that was sunk by wolf packs the amount of ships torpedoed was absolutely phenomenal. The Coast Guard vessels located the submarines went back and dropped the depth charges. These were like dynamite, kegs of dynamite launched into the water that would cause an explosion. And deter or sink German submarines. They were able to keep the wolf pack, as it were, uh, at bay. The wolf pack fell off their sonar screens. The waters were frigid. There was ice in the water. The Dorchester had slowed down and was falling back away from the convoy. Rumors can generate pretty quickly. They don't know what they're doing. They're taking us into a dangerous area. Uh, many different things uh, can, can come up where it will break down the, the confidence. In early 1943, our victory in the war, the Allied victory in the war, was not a foregone conclusion. So those soldiers had a lot of uncertainty about whether or not they were going to be part of a, an assault on mainland Europe. They didn't know. They're very nervous, the kids are, you know, kids get. And they sort of talk to the chaplains and the priests, you know, the rabbis, you know. Me, I don't talk to anybody. <laughs> I'm not a church-going soul. The four chaplains definitely had their own human emotions. I'm sure they confided in one another, just like I would confide in fellow chaplains to help my spiritual well-being, to help boost up my morale so that I could be that much stronger for the troops. Did the chaplains have these kind of fears and hesitancies? You bet they did. Clark Pulling, his whole thought, as he expressed it in his letters to his wife, Betty, and, and to his father, was to keep from becoming a coward under pressure. Because he was afraid that he wouldn't be strong enough once he hit the front lines as a chaplain to really go through with it. Pulling was thinking in a very spiritual way of the idea of God caring for everybody and not just for any particular group. And that's why it was easy for him to harmonize his views with those of other religions. On the Dorchester, there was a fear that they might get hit. And because of that, the commander of the ship told the soldiers that they should wear their life jackets even when they're sleeping. The captain spoke to everyone and stated that we know there's a submarine following us. We're 90 miles from Greenland. I wish all of you luck, but one thing you must do, sleep with everything on. Every bit of clothing that you have on. Shoes, socks, overcoats, life preservers, don't leave a thing off. A lot of the men chose not to do that because they were sleeping in warmer parts of the ship. The life jackets were, were bulky and they were uncomfortable, uh, preventing them from rest, so they ignored that. 
the chaplains went around reminding men to sleep in their full gear and of the importance of doing so, but always taking the fun uh, angle on it and, and helping to quell the men's fear. And that was when I think they came up with the idea, we better have a, um, a variety show. There are no on they schemed up a musical review, which they did on board the ship, that was apparently outrageously funny. And the chaplains were the stars of the show. And they all uh, apparently could sing very, very well. They all had these wonderful voices, and, uh, and they loved to perform. They were performers. This is not unusual for preachers, of course. There's a, a link to preaching and performing. As it turned out, they would face the very worst. In the dead of night, the enemy would strike, and terror would rule. One of the remaining U-boats that had not been diverted from the depth charges had the Dorchester in its sights. On February 3rd, 1943, at one o'clock in the morning, we heard this tremendous explosion. We were hit by a torpedo. The torpedo hit into the right side of the ship. Everything went black. All lights disappeared. We heard the big blast. It knocked me about 10 foot, just like us hitting a solid wall. The torpedo went in right where they were sleeping. So it went in there and blew those men all to pieces. It was panic. Everybody rushed up the one stairs to the left, and that was blocked. So we just had a narrow stairway go right straight up to the next deck, and because everybody running like lunatics, it was every man for himself. People were frantic. People who didn't forgot their life preservers. People who didn't have clothes on. Some of them were crying. They were just caught completely surprised, and they didn't know what to do. Ammonia came up in there and made tears to your eyes and breathing was difficult. And over the megaphones, they hollered to us and told us to ban the ship. When we got to the outside deck, we were hit with a blast of cold and ice. One of the cooks came on deck, he had a meat cleaver. Going through the crowd, he wanted to get off. and One of the officers shot him. Everybody was trying to make their way off because uh, the ship was listing to the starboard side so fast. The ship sank, in, uh, by best estimates, in about 18 minutes, which is a very short amount of time. The chaplains made their way to the top deck, doing everything that they could to try to give soldiers some direction in order to save as many lives as they possibly could. They were almost like traffic cops in the midst of a New York City traffic jam. The four chaplains were caring for the uh, injured servicemen that were injured from the blast of the torpedoes, providing life vests for servicemen. One of the soldiers, he couldn't even get his life jacket on because of the injury. One of the chaplains, Chaplain Good, helped him put his life jacket on. He took his shoestrings off, his own boots, in order to help tie this life vest around this soldier that was injured. And the ship was sinking. That that was the only thing in our mind, in my mind anyway, is to follow directions, go to, go to my lifeboat. I went over to a, a raft and we tried to loosen it and get it untied so we could shake it loose. But we couldn't do it. It was all frozen in there with ice. Most of the men were absolutely just frozen in a different way. They, they, they couldn't think, they were so fearful. They looked down into the water and they saw this big black void, freezing void with ice floating around in it. The chaplains were trying to encourage those soldiers to, to jump off the ship. Those chaplains were putting men on the fall line. They dropped cargo nets off 
So he climbed on the cargo nets and jumped in the water. Of course, when you hit that water, oh, it's like jumping in a bucket of ice. The water, who would want to go into that water, which was extremely, extremely cold? Many of the men became so frozen in fear that they couldn't do a thing, just frozen. They were absolutely frozen and couldn't move. One man was panicking and he had grabbed a hold of his chaplain, was hanging on to him. And I grabbed him by the shoulder and I said, come on, fella, let's get on the fall line, let's get down here. And uh, he wouldn't let loose of that chaplain. I heard screaming, father, help me. I'm freezing to death, just screaming, I'm cold, I'm freezing. There was one soldier that yelled and said, I'm going back for my gloves. Chaplain Good gave his own gloves away to the soldier. And he said to the soldier, I have another pair. And the, the lieutenant knew very well that, that uh, Chaplain Good was lying. He didn't have a second pair. The four chaplains took off their life preservers and gave it to men, four strange soldiers, who didn't have a life preserver on. And they gave it to them so that they could possibly survive this ordeal. These chaplains, they could have been the first one to jump overboard into the lifeboat. They could have kept their life vest, but they made decisions. They were very courageous men. I guess they knew that they weren't going to make it. They knew that the moment they removed their life preservers, they couldn't possibly survive. I'm sure they felt confident within their, within their faith and within their trust, their trust in God. There's a humility also involved in this, giving up your life jacket to someone else. And the humility is maybe someone else whose life is preserved as a result of this act can do more with their life than I could with the remainder of mine if I were to survive this tragedy. It took guts. I mean, I wouldn't do it. If I had a life jacket, I'd say, you got one, you should have had one. If you haven't got that stuff, start swimming. I dare say now that I think these men of the cloth have a special bond to the man upstairs. For them to do this act is beyond one's imagination. The ship was about to go down, but the chaplains were about to lift their men to new heights. The four would come together to shine a beacon of hope in the ship's darkest hour. When I got into the lifeboat, I turned around and I saw a sight that will never leave me. Around the outside railing were little red lights, and they were dotted all around the railing. It looked like a Christmas tree. And each light represented a soldier a human being. That's when I saw these four men standing arm in arm on the top of the boat. The chaplains locked arms and prayed together. They linked arms and then they joined in singing hymns, each of them in a different language. One was Latin, one was Hebrew, another was English. And they were humming these songs uh, while the ship went down, Father Washington's glasses had been knocked off, and uh, Rabbi Good's face was smudged with, uh, with smoke and oil and grime. And uh, to see them in that disheveled moment of um, disaster all around them, and yet this inner calm in these four men as they ministered to the people around them was, as one man said, as close to heaven as I ever hoped to be. They were probably thinking about their family and how hard it, hard it would be for their family. How they were able to let their love for God overwhelm their love for 
their own lives is truly an act of, an act of faith. These men were uh, true believers. They were prepared. They were prepared for, for death if it were to come right there at that moment. And they were able to remain on, on, the, on the deck and, and to continue to provide uh, as, as a chaplain does provide. This was the greatest thing they could do in their life, was to give their life for someone else. These four chaplains are remembered in many ways. There are chapels that are built in their memory and to their honor. There are monuments, there's pictures. But more importantly, their courage, their lives live on in our memory. In 1948, the U.S. Postal Service brought out a stamp commemorating the chaplain's sacrifice. It says, these immortal chaplains interfaith in action. That's what it says, and that, to me, sums them up. This is the example that they gave was interfaith in action. The four chaplains are remembered today because of, of the interfaith. They're all same as one, as far as uh, being recognized by God. I think that's what the chaplain is trying to get out to people, love thy fellow man. In other words, you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. When you sacrifice your own life for a fellow man, I don't, can't think of anything more important than that. In 1960, Congress created the rarest Congressional Medal, which is never to be repeated again. And it's a medal for valor for the four chaplains. We light these candles in memory of the four chaplains who served with honor and valor of the Army transport ship, the Dorchester, Lieutenant George Fox, Lieutenant John Washington, Lieutenant Clark Poling, Lieutenant Alexander Good. They were wonderful human beings, very, very compassionate and that, I think, is the legacy that they bring forward. Whether the chaplains in our day and time are in the military service or in the uh, fire department, police department, the legacy of these four chaplains lives in them. It lives in the way that they show compassion toward other people, to helping people regardless of their faith, regardless of their race, regardless of ethnicity. As a chaplain, I can imagine being in the shoes of these four chaplains in the process of the ship going down. I thought about that during some of my time in Afghanistan, during rocket attacks or being in a convoy that was in a potentially hot area. It's a very challenging thing to think about. Sometimes we are at danger. I had to go sometimes to do services, sometimes in dangerous places. And that was part of my mission, and part of what I'm supposed to do. Gracious God, we pray for each man and each woman who will be called upon to perform this mission this evening. Gracious God, we pray that you would remove from us any fears or any doubts, any anxieties. Help us to focus on the training that we have received to make this a safe, successful jump. Gracious God, we entrust our lives and we pray for your safety. Amen. Amen. Have a great job, folks.
The history of the Army Chaplaincy dates all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Over 25,000 men and women have served as chaplains in the Army. They have served in 36 wars, over 240 major conflicts. Wherever you find our Army, there you'll find our chaplains. The story of the four chaplains is a very important message to all of us. That there's still so much goodness in the world. And one side, even though there's so much evil, there's also so much goodness in the world. Sometimes people risk everything to help others. These men were extraordinary. They were years ahead of their time. We now have to open up our minds and think, how inclusive can we be nowadays to have compassion for people who are different? Could you possibly take off your life preserver and to give it to others? It's something to think about.